route uh, jointly to, with my two PDRA, uh, PDRAs, Wana Lang and Alexander Lobe, uh, also uh, joined with uh, PTRM Van Loven from Colorado and Roland Podcast from DWD. Okay, so uh, I normally explain what the filtering problem is, but there is no time. All, I, all I'm going to say is that you know the filtering problem uh, aims to kind of estimate the uh, 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 a, a hidden component, um, and you know I I'm sort of pictorially I'm presenting here this uh, uh, a state 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 space model which takes value in some high dimensional state. We, we, we're currently working with um, a, a million dimensions or thereabouts. Um, and then you have some observation, some partial observation uh, of this hidden state. This is your this is your data, and what you want to compute or approximate is the conditional distribution of uh, uh, this process, which we call the signal, uh, with respect to the observational data accumulated over time. And you know this is uh, we call the posterior distribution. And the way in which I uh, uh, represent it is by these blobs of mass that moves move through space. And the state space is sort of always part of the support of the posterior distribution. And you know, here there's the model, and I'm not going to uh, spend time on telling you what the model is. The thing is, you do your data simulation, you do your filtering, starting from some time, nominal time zero, and you evolve it in time. Uh, uh, you, you evolve in time your posterior distribution by using your observations. But before you get to do that, you have to have a model and you have to calibrate the model. And the cali so the, the, it is this part that I'm going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about data simulations or filtering. I'm going to talk about calibrating the model, in particular calibrating the stochastic parameterization. And for this, we will need samples from the model. And I'm going to explain how you get these samples uh, in what follows. Um, OK, so now why, is, why do you need stochastic parameterization? And this is uh, taken from uh, a paper uh, which appeared uh, in the American Meteorological Society in 2017, and it has uh, a, a large number of people uh, that signed on this paper. So it's I'm 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 not this is not something that uh, I uh, wrote. I love it because it makes a strong case for the use of stochastic PDEs in um, in numerical weather prediction is written by all of these papers. And you know, if you can see it, you should be able to recognize most of them. OK, so uh, what I'm saying here is that numerical weather predictions and climate model is, mo modeling is based on discretization of some continuous equations of mo uh, motion, read PDEs. And these are Im embedded, these are uh, numerically uh, simulated in some dynamical core which this, uh, describes the resolved scales of motion, uh, including para uh, physical parameterizations, and they will give estimate of the processes at the level of the grid scales where the, the uh, uh, discretization is done. Beyond that, this cannot be done. They cannot be resolved. And so far, the, this approach has been very successful uh, in weather and climate, and people do, do, do have very good forecasts uh, with high skills in this area. However, it has become apparent that we, you know, there is a bottleneck there that there are systematic shortcomings uh, due to the fact that the RS or processes are not properly represented. Okay, and there's a lot of uh, physical processes which are there and they are not, uh, they cannot be ca captured by this numerical imp implementation of the PDEs. And uh, on, to on top of that, you would like to be able to ascertain the uncertainty of the model. And you can't do that by using uh, the PDE uh, approach. As a result, you have to resort to, resort to stochastic parameterization to account to uh, estimate uncertainty and reducing, reduce the systematic model error um, uh, that comes from the unresolved scales and all these other things which are, are enumerated in there. You know, the bottom line is, and this is really a subtitle of the paper, of this paper that uh, appeared in the American uh, Meteorological Society, is that uh, stochastic parameterizations empirically derived or based on rigorous mathematical and statistical concepts have great potential to increase the predictive capability 
of next generation weather and climate forecasts. OK, so this is something which we embrace. And as somebody that works on stochastic TDs, uh, it, you know, I love it because that means that what we do makes sense from an application perspective. OK, so now I'm going to explain how we uh, incorporate stochastic parameterization and um, and then how do you end up with an SPDE rather than a PDE? And then how do you calibrate that stochastic parameterization? So the way I do it, I do it in a very generic form. And then you know I'll give you some examples, but uh, you will see that uh, I hope to make the point that this particular calibration technique that I will present can be applied to any example that you encounter in numerical weather prediction. So in general, let's say, let's suppose that we have a GFD model, which is a solution of a PDE. So you start with the PDE, you start with the PDE, and I'm writing here, I'm writing this as a PDE, where A is this is a, an operator defined on a set of uh, functions and so on, but this is just to start with a simple form of your PDE, and we are assuming that this is a high resolution model. You're assuming that this is a model for your small scale, your uh, high resolution simulations that, that you have. And what you want to do, you want to say, okay, I'm not going to use this high resolution uh, model. I want to use a low resolution model. Right? That because of that, because you're going to use a low resolution model, you will have unresolved scales. The how do you model these unresolved scales? you will add to it a stochastic term. And I'm writing this stochastic term in this form here. OK, this is added to your PDE. You end up with an SPDE here. OK, and I'm trying to explain what this is here. So M here is going to be another param another operator, and I'm going to give you some examples of operators. OK, and then WT here is a cylindrical Brunner motion. And for those of you that know about this, you know, it, is, it can be an infinite sum of one dimensional Brownian motion modulated by, by, some, uh, by some fields here, psi k, which depend on your, on the space, right? So these are space dependent vector fields, and these are one dimensional Brownian motion, and the object of the parameterization is to estimate this psi k. So what I will explain is how do, how do you estimate this psi k? under the assumptions that you know what A is and you know what M is, modulo this psi k. And this is the simplest example uh, that we can think, in, you can think of in geophysical fluid dynamics. You take the 2D Euler equation in vorticity form. You can write it like this, where omega is uh, the vorticity and U is the velocity. You can write it, the, the operator that you have in here has this specific form. I'm not going to go through the details. It's just that to show you that that's what you have in general. And then you can say, OK, now how do I add in stochastic parameterizations to this particular um, PD, to the 2D Euler equation? Well, there's lots of ways in which, can, in which you cannot do that. You can have something which is additive parameterization. You can just add your single parameter motion, or you can have something which is multi multiplicative or you can have transport parameterizations, and there are many, many others like that. OK, the methodology that I will present to you applies to any of these type of parameterizations and applies to any uh, PD that you encounter in geophysical fluid dynamics. OK, now I'm, I would make the point next that, that you know, it's important to do this stochastic parameter, to add this uh, stochastic parameterization um, because the influence of the small scales is massive. OK, so I'm going to show you next. Uh, I'm going to show you next a, a simulation. Let's see if this is working. So what you see here, you see here an evolution of the Euler equation, right, in a box. And here is the evolution of the velocity. Here is the evolution of the vorticity. OK, so this is on the small scale, on, on, a, on a refined scale. Underneath here is the same run on the core scale. What you should see in here is that very quickly they start to differ. They don't differ just because of the uh, modification of the coarsening, but you know they differ fundamentally. The effect of the small scale becomes accumulates over time 
and they get quite far apart from one another. So that's it. that is why you need to account for the small scale by doing something, for example, by adding stochastic parameterization. OK. Right. What, are, what is the general principle of the stochastic parameterization, of the calibration that I uh, uh, we developed? What you do, your data is your, uh, the solution of the PD, MF, and what you do, you get the modifications of that, a modification of that. Uh, for example, you apply a low pass filter to that. You take the difference between the solution and the modification. You get this, this uh, process M hat, which is supposed to kind of incorporate uh, the effects of the small scales. And then you look at the increments of this process and the increments of the, this process, you make the ansatz that they'll look like this, which is exactly the, the uh, stochastic term that you apply in, in, the, in, 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 in the first place. OK, so that's your ansatz. OK, these increments will look like this a list in distribution, which you can approximate in this way. And then the next step is to compute this psi k by using a principal component analysis. That's it. In, this is in a nut, nutshell that what we do, right? You know, it looks very simple, but there's a lot of work in order to get the psi k out of this uh, term increments in here. And so the, the remarks that I like to add in here is that when you, when you solve the PD and the SPD is that these are theoretically defined on the same physical domain, but when you numerically approximate them, you approximate one on the refined grid and the other one on the coarse grid. Now, the calibration procedure is agnostic to the source of input data. In what we will do, I'm going to show you how we do, uh, how we do this uh, by using synthetic data from a model that is run um, on, uh, on a refined grid for a sufficiently large time in window. But this can be real, real data coming from the analysis. So this is where the analysis will play a role. We extract data from the analysis and apply it here to do the calibration. OK, now the, the way in which the results depend on the choice of the perturbation, on the choice of the stochastic uh, parameterization, you'll get different size for different choices of this, right? But for all of them, you can essentially apply the same steps that I enumerated above. OK, now I'm explaining I'm explaining here uh, what you do in the case for in the case when you have a um, an additive noise. In this case, the applications is almost straightforward. You just do the increments. You look at the increments of the M hat. And in this case, the increments will have approximately a normal distribution uh, with uh, a sum which is depends on the psi k, and then here it's, you can, it's straightforward to apply principal component analysis to compute both the psi k and the number of uh, and the number of psi k themselves. Okay, so there's lots of things that have to be added in here. You know, you have to make sure that uh, you decorrelate the data so that you get independent samples. Uh, you make you know the PCA involves computing <coughs> uh, covariance metrics, some of the sample covariance metrics. And the most important things to realize here is that the psi k's depend on your data. The psi, the psi k's are data dependent, okay? And you need a lot of data to compute the psi k. And it's not a parameter estimation. And that by saying that, I'm saying that because, because the psi k depend on the data, that means that you can have different psi k when you use different data and they all will work. Right. So <clears throat> what is the model that uh, we looked at? So this is the uh, rotate, stochastic rotating Charlotte equation. So you start with a deterministic model, which depends on, which is uh, uh, the evolution equations of the velocity field uh, of uh, two-dimensional fluid and the height. <laughs> and I'm explaining here what the height is. And you just have to take my word uh, uh, that the height is what it is. And um, I'm just going to flash the model in front of you because I need to get to uh, the actual simulations. You know, everything is explained in details for people that want to see here. Uh, we have a term uh, that incorporates the uh, effect of the rotation uh, and a term that incorporates the 
effect of the gravitation. And you know, you can write it in this form. And here I'm explaining many things why this is a good uh, model to test. It comes very close to the primitive equations, which is the equation used in the numerical weather prediction, and it has a lot of other uh, nice properties. And the next step is to explain how you get this stochastic parametrization. And there's, there's a lot of uh, work in here. There's a lot of mathematics in here. And uh, this is not a, an obvious, a trivial stochastic parametrization. At the base of all this is this idea that you add stochasticity to the Lagrangian particles, not to the Eulerian picture. Okay, and this has been uh, advocated by my colleague at Imperial Daryl Holm in 2015, and there's been a lot of work since then from him and from uh, myself and my collaborators. This is how the stochastic parametrization looks like at the level of the SPD. So you have the deterministic part, but you have a stochastic part added to each one of these, right, in terms of operators that are definitely far from, uh, from using from the additive uh, noise parametrization. It's really very complicated, but the claim here is that this is a physical stochastic parametrization. And this uh, leads to an SPD that has, uh, is well posed and so on and so forth. Okay, so now let me, exp let me give you, uh, let me explain, let me give you the results. So um, the PD is run on this fine grid, okay? And then we have to wait for a thousand time steps to get something which looks uh, sort of reasonably interesting. And then here I'm explaining again what we do in this case. This is a far harder uh, uh, application because it's not immediately uh, obvious how to get to the psi k, how, uh, how to get to the data. So, you know, there's a lot of work in here that we've done, but I'm going to um, jump over this. I want to just show you the results. So the results, so we have eight experience, experiments in here. First of all, the first thing is we explain 90% of the variance. So when you do the PCA, you have to decide how much of the variance you're going to explain, either 90% or 99%. So you will have more noise added if you want to explain more of the variance, and in the case of 99%. And then when we're going to run, when we're going to run the simulations of the SPD, you will have, you will see simulations with uh, 50 realizations of the SPD and 100 realization of the SPD. And then when you do the coarsening, the coarsening is done from this, from this fine grid to this choice of these two grids. 256 by 40 and 556 by 80. So you divide everything by four for this one and everything by eight for this one. That's the coarsening that is done. So for each of these, for each of these choices, we have one experiment. So the first thing that I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you what the Xi K are. So the Xi K are these uh, fields which are obtained via the PCA. Um, from the data, from the data. So this is this is the first one. This is the one that explains most of the uh, variability, right? And you can see that you know it's it's all it has a lot of core scale features, right? And you you can you, when you go to the the last one, the last one explains a lot less, but it has a lot of small scale features. So these are the psi case that appear in for, in front of your. Uh, uh, Brownian motions. That's how they look, and there's there's nine different psyche coming up one after the other. And what I'm showing you here is we've done the calibration, and now we compute independent realization of the SPD. What you see in the middle, so we looked, we we took two two points on the grid, on the coarse grid, and we identified these with points on the refined grid. And we looked at the we looked at the realization of the PD, and then we compare the realization of the PD with realizations of the SPD. So this is for the elevation, this is for the zonal velocity, and this is for the meridian meridional velocity. So what you should you should see in here essentially that you know the the PD runs smoothly, 
The HPD, you know, it gets perturbed, but essentially stays close to the PD and there is a spread. Because you want to have a spread when you do the data assimilation is the big problem there. You have to have enough spread in order to be able to spread the particles and also let the particles survey the, uh, sur survey the underlying space. Here, the spread is done automatically by the stochastic parametrization. OK, so now we look at the ensemble sp spread, right? So this is the thing that is really very important that really uh, says whether a particular parametrization is good or not. So when you look at that and we what you hear, what you see here, you should see you, you see four sets of two pairs of, re of realizations. Now, these two at the bottom, the, 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 these are the, uh, the this, this are the spread corresponding to the 90% of variability and corresponding to the coarsening degree by four. So here you need the least amount of stochasticity, therefore the spread is smallest. Okay. The next one is when you coarsen the, the uh, grid by uh, uh, by eight and you get this. And then the, the following two is when you coarsen the grid by four, respectively eight, and then you want to explain 99% of variability, right? So the most, the most randomness appears when you explain 99% of variability and you have the coarsening of the grid by eight, which is you know, quite understandable. You can see that the spread is fairly stable, and this is true both for the elevation, uh, for the zonal velocity, and for the meridional velocity. So, you know, the, the stochastic parametrization does the job correctly. The RMSE, the RSME, the RMSE is, uh, uh, tells you a uh, uh, similar picture. Again, you know, we have stability, five minutes, you have stability uh, in the size of the RMSE. And again, the, the biggest effect is coming from having to explain 99% of the variability. Increasing the number of particles from 50 to 100 has the least effect, right? So that means that already when you have 50 particles, you know you 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 have enough spread. You won't be able, you won't get more spread if you increase the number if you double the number of particles. And for the L2 relative L2 error, of course, these are things you know we we have you you haven't done any data assimilation, so there's no correction me me mechanism. So you do, you should expect things to keep increasing. Right, uh, but you know, once you start applying the data simulations, you you stabilize the L2 error, and so in this case, it's natural to see things increasing. Uh, this is not the case for the elevation. We can't explain why the elevation is decreasing towards the end. Presumably, it's going to go back up uh, after that. Okay, so final remarks. Um, what we did, we introduced a generic calibration method that can be applied for any stochastic GFD model. So you choose your model. You choose your stochastic uh, uh, parametrization, and this can be calibrated by what we, uh, uh, but what I explained in here. This calibration is Wallerian in, in nature. That means you need to have uh, when you do the uh, when you get the data, the data has to be available to you at all points on the grid. This is different from what we did before. We did what we did before. We did Lagrangian calibrations where. We looked at, we calibrate by looking at what happens to the Lagrangian particles. So we have a paper uh, uh, jointly with Colin Cotter and my, my uh, PDRAs. Um, this calibration can be applied to um, any type of stochastic noise, additive, multiplicative, transport noise. The one that we favor is the so called uh, salt uh, noise. Salt comes from uh, stochastic elevation by lead transport. And it's been we've been working a lot on these things and try to explain why this is a physical uh, calibration as a physical parametrization as opposed to the one that uh, are enumerated above. This parametrization generates a super suitable ensemble spread for the coarse uh, grain true state, and that means that you can then use this for your choice of uh, data simulation techniques um, and. Um, this is all in preparation for the forthcoming observational data from the SWOT mission. And if people want to see what this means, they can look at the um, NASA uh, website. The point 
I'm going to close up with this. Do not try to apply additive uh, uh, parameterization. It doesn't work. And we have in the paper, we explain in the paper why is that you end up with very small spreads because this is not physical. OK, so last but not least, uh, <clears throat> we have a running program which is sponsored by the European Union. Uh, we got this before Brexit. Uh, and so uh, we were, I think we were the last ones and then the door closed after us. Uh, if people are interested uh, to uh, talk to us, we do a lot of work. We have a lot of activities. Um, it's called the Synergy Grant and you just have to type steward and then you will find it there. This is jointly with uh, INRIA and IFMR. There, there are four PIs, myself, Bertrand Champron, Dario Holm, and Etienne Memin. And we have a very ambitious plan. We just, we are about halfway uh, through, uh, through the project. And there are many, many ways for people to interact with us. Just send us, send us an email, email and we can discuss. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna just show you a few of my papers on uh, related to the topic that I discussed. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Um, any questions? Thank you. Uh, can I just ask a really basic question? Uh, I think I missed this. Where did you get the data from to do the PCA? Yes. So, uh, so in this case, we use synthetic data. We run the PD. Run the PD. We run, we run stochastic the, the rotating shell of the equation on a very refined grid. Record it, this, and apply the calibration methodology. That is, that was it. We, we, we did synthetic data. But of course, you can use the analysis data and do the same thing. Okay, any other question? Sorry. Uh, can you explain again the where the so you say you have 50 or 100 particles, but I was not very clear on how where does that diversity come? And I think you mentioned it's kind of a second part. You mentioned the, the the you can use observational data. So, but there you'd have observation noise as well. And so, um, would would be, would it be easy to kind of decorrelate the two uh, to basically learn really only the the, the noise and the dynamics and without being influenced by the observational noise? Okay, so once you once you calibrate the once you calibrate your SPD, right, you know exactly what this term is, and then when you run the particles, you run the particles with independent realizations of the noise. So that's how you get the spread. You just run independent realizations of the of the noise. That's all you do. Now at this point in time, I have not started to do my data simulation. All I did is just make sure that this calibration have enough spreads so that I then I'm I can begin to do the data simulations and use observations in you know, partial observations with noise or without noise and so on to try to you know select this what it what the, the one that are the right one and weight them and so on and so forth so at this point there is no observations I'm just calibrating uh, the SPD and the spread comes from having independent Brownian motion. So we can have independent, 50 independent realizations of Brownian motion or 100, realization, 100 of them. And the point is the spread does not increase, which means that you're going to be okay to use something of 50 to 101. You will not, you not have to use a bigger, uh, a larger number of particles when you do your ensemble data simulation. Okay, well, I think in the interest of time, we can thank uh, Dan again.